Okay, thanks so much, and good evening, everybody. I bring you greetings from the Dallas area, and it's the home of the Institute for Creation Research's Discovery Center. So if you have an opportunity to go to Northern Texas, please avail yourself. Please come to Northern Texas in the area of, uh, Pensac of uh, the Discovery Center of uh, the Institute for Creation Research. You will enjoy it very much. You could easily spend a day there, and uh, there is so much to see. We even have a life cycle model of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. We have portions of the uh, Mount St. Helens, Grand Canyon, a portion of Noah's Ark, anatomically correct, and so I think you'll enjoy it very much. We uh, really do appreciate what the Lord has done. It's almost brand new, the Discovery Center, and also on the back table, we have a sign-up sheet, so if you want to sign up for the free ICR publication, Acts and Facts, you get one copy every two months, and you can see what a uh, the ICR is up to. We are the Institute for Creation Research, okay, and so what do you suppose we do? So easy, isn't it? And so we do research, and that's one of the, uh, the, one of the effects of the uh, publication, Acts and Facts, because we are able to share with you the research that we do as the Lord gives us an opportunity. So this evening, we're going to talk about insects. I like bugs because, uh, as it was said, I, I'm a, a zoologist, and so my field is parasites. So I'm what you call a parasitologist. And so when I was in graduate school, I shot about 35 tree swallows. I think you got tree swallows here in Washington State. They're a high altitude type bird. So I went up in the mountains of Colorado for a number of weeks, uh, very early in the morning when they were just waking up and shot about 35 tree swallows and then put them on ice and then had to dissect them. And sure enough, I found that every single bird was infected with parasites, a potpourri of parasites. One in particular, I was able to discover a new species of parasite. It was a nematode, these small white worms that maybe your dog or cat gets. But I discovered this uh, nematode inside the stomach lining of one of the birds there. And it had never been discover, uh, discussed, discovered by science. And so what do you get to do when you discover a new species? I get to name it, right. And so I decided, because I'm a really romantic guy, I decided to name it after my wife. <laughs> it's not for the reason you think. It's because I wanted to get her name in the scientific literature. Now, her name before I met her was Janice Felty, so I wanted to call the, the parasite Acuaria Jenny Feltii. Kind of trips off the tongue there. Sounds very scientific and very melodious, and I was all excited, and my wife said no. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that afternoon before she said no, I went home and I said, sweetheart, I discovered this new species of parasite. I'm going to name it after you. When I woke up, <laughs> and so uh, anyway, so the big question of the evening is, well, Frank, what did you call it? And the answer is I called it Acuaria coloradensis. Why do, I, why do you suppose I called it coloradensis? See how easy science is? Science is so easy, yeah. And so I found it in Colorado, so as I called it. And uh, now that parasite is in the American type culture. Now, the American type culture is at a certain part of the United States of America. Uh, the American type culture is where you, where you find the new parasites and the bacteria, the viruses, just all this really yucky stuff. They all put together, seriously, in the American type culture. Where do you suppose that city would be located? Answer, Washington, D.C., <laughs> where all the other parasites are. And so... <laughs> Anyway, what I, I discovered was you don't have to go to France to study parasites. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'll be here all evening. <laughs> All right, so this evening, if we can dim the lights here, we're going to talk about insects because insects, I, I really enjoy, enjoy insects because they are the intermediate stage of a lot of parasites. For example, when you get bit by a mosquito, mosquitoes spread malaria, right? Fortunately, you're not going to get malaria here in Washington State. It's not the right species and so forth. But um, yeah, mosquitoes are, uh, carry a potpourri of, of uh, really deadly and potentially deadly uh, type of uh, creatures. And so uh, insects, and parasites go together like, you know, bread and butter. So anyway, um, so that's, that's why I like to study uh, um, insects. And so 
We find in Psalm 111 um, that the works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. His work is honorable and glorious. He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. And so I really agree with what the psalmist said in Psalm 111. Insects have three pairs of legs, six legs, and usually two pair of wings born on the thorax. And there's about 750,000 living species of insects, and that's, we've only scratched the surface. There's probably a lot more than that. And um, so it's a really a wide open field. That field is called entomology. Well, the Apostle Paul talks about God's creation in Romans chapter 1. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 1 is really a cross-section of what's going on in the world today. Uh, it's it, uncanny how Paul gets it right as we read Romans chapter 1. He talks about how in the last days, and I personally think we are living in the last days, natural man, that is unregenerate man, will worship the creation and not the creator, exactly. And so uh, that, this is what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 1. And in verse 20, he says that God's creation is clearly seen. Now, Paul could have said that God's creation is seen. That's fine. But Paul really wanted to emphasize. And so he said that God's creation is clearly seen. Two words, clearly seen. Can we say that to the class? clearly seen. God's creation is clearly seen. Pastor, the Sherwin translation of that is painfully obvious. <laughs> and so it is, it is a, a clearly seen creation. Why is that? Well, we could uh, float maybe a, a number of reasons why, but I really do think it's because God's love. God loves us so much that he has made his creation not only seen, but clearly seen, even though we live in a fallen world, don't we? Do you remember the four C's of Genesis? The first C is creation in Genesis chapter 1, where God tells us 10 times that he created after their kind, right, after their kind. And, you know, God is kind of treating us like children, as indeed we are, as we as parents treat our children. When you want to emphasize something, you say it many times and you're redundant. You say it many times and you're redundant. You say it many, okay, you get the idea. And so what God is telling us 10 times in Genesis chapter 1 is that he created after their kind. Okay, 10 times. In other words, what is God telling us? Uh, personally, this is what I think God is telling us. He's telling us he didn't use evolution. He's telling us he did not use evolution. He created after their kind. So dog kind and cat kind and cattle kind and so forth. And we can go down the zoological laundry list there. So that was a creation. And then in Gen Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, the great deceiver, Satan, said to Eve, words that the first words out of his mouth were deceptive. Yea, hath God said. In other words, the first recorded words from Satan is to question God's authority. And we all know how that worked out. And so that's the corruption of the creation. So the first C is the creation, Genesis 1. The second C is Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, yea, hath God said. And then God cursed the earth, didn't he? So that's our third C this evening. God cursed the earth with, do you remember reading? Weeds, thorns, thistles, okay. What's my field? Parasites. And so parasites, I think, probably were part of the, uh, the curse. Can I be dogmatic about that? No, because the Bible doesn't say so. And so we would think that parasites would fit into God cursing the earth with weeds, thorns, thistles, probably parasites. I have to be cautious because Scripture doesn't say that. But I think it leaves a door open. Also, genetic mistakes. What are genetic mistakes called? Mutations. Mutations. So God cursed the earth with weeds and thorns and thistles and, and uh, parasites and genetic mistakes and telemarketers and so things like that. <laughs> and so uh, that is the curse, right? And then God sent a worldwide deluge, right? So that's the fourth C, deluge. No, no, that doesn't be under the C. How about catastrophe? Okay. So let's go ahead and list them, class. Creation, corruption, curse, catastrophe, okay? And of course, in the New Testament, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And there's three C's with the Lord Jesus Christ, the cradle, the cross, and the crown. He's coming back in power and glory. Whew, it's enough to make a Baptist shout. <laughs> okay, so what are the three C's of the Lord Jesus Christ? Cradle, cross, 
and the crown. Okay, so a quick Bible study this evening before we get into the insects. Um, living things like insects clearly look they, like they were designed by God, okay? And if they clearly look like they were designed by God, can we not entertain that and, and pursue that line of reasoning uh, as opposed to evolutionary naturalism that says that everything is just a mistake? As a matter of fact, we have a war of the worldviews, don't we? One worldview says, in the beginning, God. The other worldview says, in the beginning, nothing, <laughs> okay? Which is more scientific. Well, I think it's more scientific to say, in the beginning, God, that someone was there when? In the beginning, okay? The evolutionists, because they don't believe God, they don't believe God's word, they have to say, in the beginning, nothing. And so everything that you see here came ultimately from nothing. Well, evolutionists say they're scientific and that we are the ones that are unscientific. So let's go ahead and conduct a scientific investigation as to how we can show something can come from nothing. Boy, what do you do? Well, the first thing you do is put on a white lab coat, right? <laughs> and then you step into a 21st century uh, science laboratory, okay? Now, here we go. I'm wearing my, my white lab coat. We're going to show how something comes from nothing. What do you reach for? <laughs> what, what do you adjust? The whistles and the bells, you know, open up a cupboard and get what? A, a box of nothing? <laughs> We're out of nothing. Get another case of nothing. You know, so there's really nothing, no pun intended, that you can do to show something comes from nothing. nothing, okay? So what does it take to say everything came from nothing? Faith. It takes faith. And does it take faith to believe that in the beginning God created? Shake your head like this. Yeah, it takes faith to believe that in the beginning God created. Sometimes, occasionally, I'll have debates with evolutionists, and they try and get that Frank Sherwin of ICR to admit his position is based on faith. I'm going, yeah, yeah, because what does it say in the uh, book of Hebrews, chapter 11? For without faith, it's impossible to please him, meaning God. Do you want to please God this evening? Exercise faith, you bet. And so, yes, yes, absolutely. I make no apologies for saying that ultimately my faith is based on what God did approximately 6,000 years ago. Yeah, I understand that to be true. And the evolutionist has to, <laughs> they have to admit that theirs is a position of faith to say everything came from nothing. Now, when you talk to an evolutionist, they'll say, no, no, everything came from the Big Bang. In Texas, we call it the Large Bang. Okay, but anyway, <laughs> but they say everything came from the Big Bang, but that is incorrect. That's not what the cosmologist, the atheistic cosmologist, cosmology is a study of the universe. It's a pretty big field. <laughs> but uh, they, they say, uh, yeah, everything came from the Big Bang, but that's incorrect. That is not what the evolutionist and the atheist are saying. They're saying that the Big Bang only explains the expansion of the universe. It does not explain the origin of the universe. And it's a big question mark as to the origin of the universe. In other words, what happened 15 minutes before the Big Bang? Nobody knows, okay? And how, how would you undergo a, a process of investigation, of empirical research? You just, you can't do anything like that. And so when they say the Big Bang, say, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, the Big Bang only explains the expansion of the universe. And by the way, that is a significant problem in atheistic cosmology, the expansion problem. I won't get into that, but it's, it's um, an interesting area. You get onto icr.org and, and type in questions like that in our search engine and, and get some um, good answers there. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, this, here's two examples of the design. We said, you know, things look like they were designed, and we believe they were designed, so I'm just going to give you two quick examples uh, here in the world of insects. First of all, this is the uh, moth, and anybody know with that feathery antenna that you see there, is that a male or a female? You have a 50% chance. <laughs> Answer is, it's a male. These are a male moth with this very, very beautiful array of antenna. Well, why did God design the male moth like that? Well, because the female moth, who may be downwind or upwind or whatever else, a couple of miles away, is releasing something called pheromones. And now you remember that from your high school biology, pheromones. Um, 
the pheromones are like a perfume, okay? And so the female releases this perfume or pheromone into the wind, and the wind carries this just very beautiful pheromone, this, this uh, perfume, and it gets diluted by the air current, doesn't it? It gets more and more diluted until you have just a single molecule, this organic molecule, a carbon-based molecule, and all you need, and experiments have been done on this, is we call it empirical research, what we can observe, test, and repeat, that's empirical research, and they found that just takes one pheromone molecule to strike that feathery antenna array, and it rings a bell. <laughs> and that male, uh, that male uh, uh, moth goes, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Somebody <laughs> is around here. And they, the male moth then is alerted and begins to search. Is he successful? Shake your head like this, because why? We, we still have male moths today. <laughs> and so they must somehow get it right and are successful, but it really is a, just a fascinating area. Uh, they've done some uh, research on that, and uh, this is a diagram. I know you can't see it too well there, but this is uh, how they figure this male moth is able to process the information in an area of uh, their head called the subesophageal ganglion. I know it's kind of late in the evening to be talking like that, but it's the insect idea of a brain, and so it is very, very fascinating. And what about this? This is a Example number two, metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is a real challenge for evolutionary naturalism. We as creationists regularly, diplomatically challenge the evolutionists to tell us how metamorphosis, how you change from a caterpillar with 3,000 muscles into something as ornate as a butterfly or moth that has less than half of that number. Uh, and it's done by this process called metamorphosis. It all has to do with endocrinology, which means hormones special kinds of hormones that are released at just the right time. And at one point in this cocoon here, the, <laughs> the, what was once a caterpillar becomes just a bag of jelly with a beating heart. And within a few hours, that process begins to occur where you get this transformation and ama there, there's no adjectives, Pastor, to describe just how incredible this is, a, a, a transformation that would turn this bag of jelly into a butterfly, a butterfly. It's, uh, it'll preach, too. There's some good spiritual things there to, to keep in mind. Okay, so metamorphosis is the abrupt physical change or transformation from a larval to an adult form. And we just think about that, but think about the genetic machinery. Think about the endocrine uh, uh, secretions, which are hormones and everything else that have to play at exactly the right time, exactly the right concentration, exactly the right uh, place. It's very, very specific. Richard Milton, I've had email communication with Richard. He he is an atheist. He will not consider biblical Christianity. He said in his book, we know practically nothing about the plan or program governing the metamorphosis or organizing agency that executes this plan. And he's being very, very blunt and, and uh, can I say, intellectually honest as he confronts metamorphosis from a naturalistic point of view. Are we naturalists or supernaturalists. We're supernaturalists, okay? We believe in, in God and the angels and, and demons and all that. That's all in the supernatural realm, okay? So a naturalist doesn't believe any of that. Well, juvenile hormone is one of the hormones that, that plays a very important part in this process called metamorphosis. And it's produced by a gland in the insect. And then this is some of the, uh, of the hormones that are produced here. They're very sophisticated, very complex. When you see a word like this, estradiol, the O-L means it has an alcohol group, an O-H group. And so this is uh, a very, very complex uh, processes that are occurring within the uh, developing butterfly or moth. And, uh, well, I, I won't read that because I don't have my glasses, and it, just believe me, it's complex. <laughs> okay. Whoa. So, where did insects come from? Where did these insects come from? By the way, these are delicious. But anyway, 
Where, where did they come from? Okay, insects simply show no evolution. Now, we are uh, God's people, right? We believe by faith God's word. We believe the creation, the corruption, the curse, and the, what's the last C class? Catastrophe, the catastrophe to Genesis flood. Aha, catastrophe, Genesis chapter 6 through Genesis chapter 8 and into chapter 9. God is describing in very graphic terms a, wor a world that was totally inundated with Genesis floodwaters. How long ago, class? Uh, thousands of years ago? We'll say about 4,500 years ago. Genesis flood was about 4,500 years ago. It lasted a little over a year, and it did a lot of rearranging of the surface of the earth. Uh, a lot of uh, real estate was laid down and carved out during the year-long Genesis flood. And so when I ask how long was the Genesis flood, I always say, don't say 40 days and 40 nights, okay? How long was that? What was that? That was the rain that came down, 40 days and 40 nights, but the flood itself was a little over a year. So we as God's people, believing God's word, believe by faith, and I'm upfront about that, for without faith it's impossible to please him. By faith we understand this, these are sedimentary, and they are sedimentary rock units. Any evolutionist you talk to will say, yeah, these are sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks are rocks laid down by running water. See how easy science is? Running water. Yeah, and so what are the most common of the sedimentary rocks? Sandstone, limestone, and shale. Sandstone, limestone, and shale. Sounds like a law firm. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, those are the three most common of the sedimentary rock units that are laid down. And so we see entombed in the sedimentary rock right here, insects. Folks, insects that we can identify right down to the genus and sometimes even the species. Well, wait a minute. The word evolution means what? If we could use one word to define what evolution is, one word, change, change, okay? That's what evolution means is change. But this indicates all these insects that we can identify right down to genus or species shows what? No change, okay? No change. So the fossil record does not document any kind of significant change that the evolutionists get all excited about. So we look at the insects that are entombed in the sedimentary rock layers that we believe by faith were laid down by the Genesis flood, and we say, where's the evidence of evolution? Where is all this compelling evidence that may, where I should believe that I came from a fish? That's basically what evolution says. And that's, by the way, what is taught in American taxpayer-paid public schools. Okay, And so we are, unfortunately, our tax dollars are being used to teach the next generation they came from lower forms of life and that the students are simply highly evolved animals. Should we be surprised when they start acting like animals? After all, that's what they're taught, right? Let's, let's make room for some science in <laughs> those science classes and get rid of that evolution that says we came from a fish. I mean, well, as we say in Texas, Pastor, I'm again it. I'm again it, okay? And so in, uh, fossil insects uh, show no evidence of evolution. We would say this if you're taking notes this evening. Insects have always been what, class? Insects. Insects have always been insects. There's no indication that they came from any other kind of creature. But how did arthropods, and by the way, an insect is an arthropod. They have paired jointed appendages and a chitinous exoskeleton. So um, like those Texas roaches, get about, about like that. When you step on them, they pop, right? They pop. Well, that's that chitinous exoskeleton failing. <laughs> Well, anyway, okay, so here this evolutionist is saying just three short years ago, they said, how did arthropods, like insects, evolve? And what did their ancestors look like? These have been a major conundrum in animal evolution, puzzling generations of scientists for more than a century. It's a conundrum. It's, pu uh, it's puzzled evolutionary scientists for more than a century. Why are we constantly told, ladies and gentlemen, that evolution is a fact? It's a fact. And, and if you don't think so, I'll just pound the podium harder and increase my vo volume of my voice, okay? That'll turn it into a fact. No, no. But the point is that, you know, we're told evolution's a fact, but we continually run into quotes like this. And I appreciate when evolutionists say this in the printed page. I, I salute them for being intellectually honest. And once again, when they start saying statements like this, why can't we put statements like this in American 
taxpayer paid public school textbooks and let the students see that evolution is not black and white like they think and that there's significant <laughs> conundrum and problem associated with this fish to philosopher, particles to people, molecules to man type of idea that we call evolution. So God created insects as 100% insects just thousands of years ago. I love this insect here. Now, uh, this insect gets to be a little bit larger than your fist. Sometimes they get a little bit larger, but there is a physical limit that insects can reach before you, they just simply cannot get any larger. And it, it gets into a lot of biology, but basically it has to do with protoplasm. Okay, protoplasm is, is uh, what is the interior, the yucky interior of an insect. And insects don't have lungs like we do. And so they have something called a tracheal tube system. These tracheal tubes that are surrounded by chitin go around and they go to individual cells and let the individual cells have the oxygen null. But if the insect gets really big, there's a lot of protoplasm, which means a lot of water. And water is a very heavy compound, by the way. And the water, the protoplasm, will collapse those tubes. And so there's no chance for insects to get as big as a house, for example, because they would suffocate. So that's today's fun fact. All right. Okay, uh, what is their evolutionary uh, history of the insects? The early evolutionary history of these insects remains murky and mired in an exceedingly poor fossil record. That's why we say that butterflies have always been butterflies. Moths have always been moths. Okay, butterflies and moths belong to the group called the Lepidoptera. And as far as we can tell in the fossil record, I love the fossil record. It documents no change. <laughs> and when we occasionally, when we do find insects, they're the kind of insects, once again, that you can classify pretty much down to genus or species. And so this is what's so exciting about being a creation scientist. We read in God's word what he did, then we go out into the field, and by George, this is what we find. And it's... It's great. It's very satisfying. And so uh, here, uh, this individual admits that there is no evidence for butterfly evolution. Here's a beetle, 49 million year old beetle. Now, we don't believe those ages for a second, no pun intended. Okay, we believe the earth is only about 6,000 years old. And so they tack on all these, I call them Darwin years, okay, because they really are are nothing. They're like fluff. They're like styrofoam. They, they're, they're nothing. They're just something that they tack on because they have to because they're evolutionists. Now, I don't want to be hypercritical, but I, I, get, I get tired of reading about all these millions of years that they throw around like, I don't know. 49 million year old beetle looks like it was squashed yesterday. Well, there you go. See, this is why it's so exciting to be a creationist because we believe that the Genesis flood was only approximately 4,500 years ago. So when evolutionists start saying things like this, and they say, it looks so recent, it looks like it was just yesterday, we're going, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> That's exactly it. So this is kind of neat. Um, the pattern is the most perfectly preserved pigment-based coloration known in fossil beetles. That's what the evolutionary author said in regard to this squashed beetle. It looks like it was squashed yesterday. Uh, it even has carbon-based material. That means organic compounds. Organic compounds in something that's 49 million years old? You can't have any carbon-based compounds at all after even just a million years. They're telling us 49 million years. So when you have something that looks like it was squashed yesterday and it has carbon-based material, that is a double whammy for us, for a young Earth. So not only is it still a beetle, not only does it look like a squash yesterday, but it has organic compounds that fits the biblical young earth narrative to a T. Uh, beetles have always been beetles. A beetle trapped in amber for over 100 million years. That was said just two years ago. 100 million years. And look at it. It's a 100% beetle. Why am I supposed to believe that it was 100 million years old? It's just a beetle. And beetles, uh, somebody said that every eighth animal on this planet is a beetle. And, and then they sarcastically said, it shows the creator had an inordinate affection for beetles. Well, 
It just means that beetles are very, very common because they uh, make the underpinnings of the, uh, of, of the ecology of the environment. They're a very, very significant portion of the ecological nature of biology and zoology. And so, yeah, beetles uh, fulfill a very, very important function. This is exciting. A blood-filled mosquito, mosquito is a fossil first, okay? A blood-filled mosquito, they found it, still had blood in it, and it was fossilized. The hair in the back of my neck went up when I read this article at ICR. It's incredible. Insects' bloated abdomen carries traces of blood molecules that are 46 million years old. Folks, it's a lot more, can I say scientific, to point to this insect as having been recently buried by the Genesis flood just thousands of years ago. And of course, if that's true, yes, of course you're going to find carbon-based material, blood molecules. I only wonder what kind of blood it came from, what you know, vertebrate. And so um, this is uh, 2013. This is a praying mantis, praying mantis. You know what praying mantis like to eat if they can catch them? A lot of people think I'm lying, but you can just go to the source of ultimate source of all information, YouTube, and uh, 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 praying mantises like to eat, I hate to say this, it almost brings a tears to my eye, uh, hummingbirds. They will actually hang out uh, upside down on a hummingbird feeder. Hummingbirds fly in, of course they hover, their wings do a fig figure eight. I wish I had time to give a presentation on hummingbirds, boy. It, but anyway, uh, and when they come down to feed at the hummingbird feeder, the praying mantis grabs them. And uh, the, the praying mantis is a very savage insect. But here we find the praying mantis, 20, 23, they said 23 to 34 million years old. Look at the variation there. Uh, anywhere from 23 to 34 million years. Look, folks, a million of anything is a lot, except dollars, okay? <laughs> but uh, just to throw around all these millions of years and say, oh, anywhere from 23 to 34, See, that's, that's why I'm saying that all these millions of years that evolutionists throw around is simply not to be believed. Uh, it, it's, um, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, <laughs> this is a second oldest known ant, and this is a fossil of an ant. I mean, look at it. It's just like an ant. They uh, began searching for the uncle, couldn't find it. But um, <laughs> anyway, ants have always been what, class? Ants have always been ants. See how easy science is. Ants have always been ants. This looks just like an ant. They tack on ever so many millions and millions of years there, but folks, it's just an ant. Just an ant. Uh, ants extend the age of an extant. Extant, that's a word that means present. So presently in, in the world today. Ant subfamilies, and they push it back about 50 million years. Well, we we don't agree with all those years. We're simply saying that ants were created by God in the beginning, thousands of years ago, as 100% ants, and they were caught up and buried in the Genesis flood. And there's other explanations that are given here, but I, I won't go into detail on that. Tear goat insects appear abruptly in the fossil record with no obvious transitional forms. Tear goat insects, that means virtually all the insects that we talk about. It's a very large classification there. But I appreciate Dudley saying this back about over a decade ago. Uh, they appear abruptly in the fossil record, he said, with, with no transitional forms. Folks, that's exactly what creation scientists are talking about. We look at the fossil record and say, here we have a record of the Genesis flood thousands of years ago and that the animals are caught up there are animals that God created in the beginning, and we would not expect to find any transitional forms. Why? Well, we covered that just a few minutes ago. In Genesis chapter 1, God created after their kind, and so we wouldn't expect to find transitional forms. I've been accused of having a fertile imagination, but I cannot begin to tell you what uh, insects came from, you know, what creature they came from, and nobody really knows, uh, and it's never been found. Give you another real quick example is bats. Bats are a mammal, right? The flying mammals, bats, fascinating creatures, especially with their sonar capability and all that. But bats have always been bats in the fossil record. 1,000 fossil bats today, 1,000 total approximately, have been found in the fossil record in what is called Eocene shale. Shale is a type of sedimentary rock laid down by running water. 
you would think out of those 1,000 fossilized bats they found, that if evolution is true, <laughs> that we should find rodents with their front legs slowly becoming what? Wings, Wings with their le leathery membrane that would turn into a bat. We have not found a single one like that. And I would like to make a prediction this evening, and scientists make predictions, right? That really shows whether you have a good theory or not so good theory. If you can make predictions about your theory, that's, that's good. And so we as creation scientists make a prediction. They will never find an animal, fossilized animal, that has half front legs and half wings as this rodent is slowly becoming a bat. <laughs> bats have always been bats. Rodents have always been rodents, and, and the, uh, goes on. So that's why I appreciate Dudley, the evolutionist, saying that in 2011. Um, how about insect wings? Boy, they are amazing. Uh, when I was in graduate school, my professor was one of the most difficult professors I ever had in graduate school, and he had us memorize how insect wings articulated at the molecular level within the thorax of the insect. And you had to take a whole page and draw it out from memory. And boy, I stood at, in those days, I, I was at a chalk board, you know, used a piece of chalk, white chalk, and some of you are nodding your heads, others are going, what, chalk? <laughs> Antacid? But uh, anyway, uh, and uh, so that's, that's what I did in graduate school, and, and sure enough, that's one of the things we had to do for our final exam. But the evolutionary origin of insect wings has long been a puzzle. This has come from a zoology textbook written by five dyed-in-the-wool, USDA-inspected, evolutionists, okay? And the guy, uh, Hickman, is a senior author, and the reason why I'm emphasizing this is when I was an undergraduate at Western State College in Gunnison, Colorado, we used one of the earlier editions of, of Hickman. And uh, so they're being intellectually honest in this university-level textbook, zoology, saying that the origin of insect wings from an evolutionary perspective is, is a big mystery. They say it's been, long been a puzzle. And it will, by the way, let me make another prediction. <laughs> it will always be a puzzle. It will always be a puzzle because insects were created by God with wings, and some don't have wings. And to say that somehow there are some insects that evolved wings, you're never going to find them because it never happened. Um, winged insects were in existence, uh, um, Hickman and the other author said, 400 million years ago. Well, again, you're throwing around those millions and millions of years, and it just doesn't make any sense. You have unwinged insects, and you have winged insects, and that's all there is. Uh, the ultimate source of all knowledge, of course, is Wikipedia. They said the evolution of insect wings has been a subject of debate. Now, I don't usually quote from Wikipedia, but Wikipedia is 100% evolution, 100%. Every time they mention creation, it's in a very negative context. And so they're admitting, too, that uh, insect wings is just a big mystery. The evolution of insect flight is simply presumed. There's no evidence for it whatsoever. Um, bee fossils are 100% bees. The fossil record of bees is pretty vast, but most are from the last 65 million years, and they look a lot like what? Modern bees, okay? I really do appreciate when evolutionists do say that. I salute them. They're, as I say, intellectually honest. Bees have always been bees. Even going back 65 million years, uh, they're still a bee. Um, uh, then, and trilobites, too. I won't get into that too much this evening. Uh, trilobites are an arthropod. Uh, they are ocean-bottom-dwelling creatures. They were the first creatures buried during the Genesis flood 4,500 years ago. Uh, these are omatidia here. You just see the topmost portion of an insect eye, like a fruit fly or something like that. You're just seeing the top of the omatidia, but then it extends long. It goes all the way down to the brain of the insect. And so this is... Uh, the, the membrane there that you see here, and that's going down, and there's all sorts of cellular, what we call sustentacular cells that sustain the individual omatidium. And I had my biology students draw that out from memory and, and label correctly all the cells that are associated with that. But even omatidia, that where it gives the arthropod an, an ability to see, is very, very sophisticated. Whoa, the tree lobster, look at that thing. That looks straight out of science friction. Uh, 
declared extinct in 1960. These six inch long stick bugs are alive and well, but critically endangered. They only live, as far as we can tell, on one island in the Atlantic Ocean. And they thought they, was ex they were extinct for, for decades until they uh, turned out to be alive and well. Here's a guy holding it, stick insect. And it's called, also called the Lord Howe Island Stick Insect, but we'll just call them stick insects. Okay, and they're, they're pretty endangered. Oh boy, the Florida mosquito. I spent nine years teaching at Pensacola Christian College. I taught pre-med and, and uh, pre-nursing class and all, and yes, we were right there in Florida, home of the infamous Florida mosquito. These things are terrifying. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> no, notice he's smiling. <laughs> Okay, so uh, yeah, Florida mosquito. Uh, these things uh, don't take any prisoners. Okay, and morpho butterfly. I was down in South America several times uh, to Lima, Peru, and I would go through the international marketplace that they had there in the evening, and uh, sure enough, they would always have these morpho butterflies on display in a glass case with the wooden frame there, and uh, I would barter with them for a couple of minutes and, and all, and they wanted the rich American to give them ever so many... Uh, 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 I think pesos or what did they have there in uh, Peru, but uh, we, we would barter uh, back and forth, and I always get two or three of these and take them back with me, and of course, they're very, very delicate in a glass case, and wouldn't, I've shattered every one of them and all. Just, But anyway, this is a morpho butterfly. You, are you seeing pigmentation there? The uh, answer is no. <laughs> you think it's pigmented, but it's not pigmented, just like the tail feathers of the uh, peacock have the same kind of sheer, uh, uh, sheen, this iridescent sheen there, but they have no coloring at all. Wait a minute, Frank, how are you saying they have no coloring? I can see that they're a kind of a metallic blue there. Well, there's a lot going on in almost the atomic scale. It's something you can't even see with a light microscope. You have to use something called an electron microscope that greatly, greatly magnifies the uh, structures that causes this to have this uh, iridescent blue sheen to it. So here we have a scanning electron microscope. This is an individual scale of the morpho butterfly, very, very tiny. And using electron microscope, we begin to magnify that scale. And this is what it looks like in the electron microscope, magnified 15,000 times. It almost kind of has a fir tree appearance, doesn't it? And um, basically what happens is you get an interference of light due to the multi-layer of the cuticle and the air. So up here we have the scales and we have the cuticles and it gets down and you can see what's called reflected light light is actually broken down into the various wavelengths of these very, very efficient structures. Nothing is left to chance. And the only portion of light that is allowed to be reflected back to our eyes is the blue portion of light. Everything else is absorbed or passes through there. And that's the nature of light. You have light coming out of this light fixture here, it does one of three things. It either is absorbed by whatever it strikes, it passes through whatever it has, uh, so it's absorbed or it's reflected. So one of those three things. So you take a very, very strong flashlight, shine it up in the sky, in the night sky, it just keeps going. It just <laughs> keeps going. Uh, so anyway, um, reflected specific, um, uh, reflects specific light wavelengths. And so there is nothing left to chance here. This is a very, very sophisticated uh, uh, process. And this is a type of visual illusion that is known as iridescence. Maybe you've heard of iridescence before. This is a, a perfect example. Well, I wish I had more time to talk about that because it gets even more strange and more detailed. But again, there's no pigment. It has to do with the breaking up of the, uh, of the light, the, the visible light spectrum. God's amazing dragonfly. Look at this. This is a dragonfly head. And most of the dragonfly head is what? Eyes, yeah, eyeballs, and so it's 80% uh, of, the, of the dragonfly's eye is the, the eye structure that you see there. They are amazing creatures. I love dragonflies, and they are what we call an indicator species, and the indicator species is a species of animal or plant that indicates the, whatever environment it's in. So, for example, the dragonfly is an indicator species for clean water. 
clean water. So if you have lots of dragonflies in your area there, you can be sure that the water around there is pretty much clean. I'm not saying crystal clear, but dragonflies shun polluted water. And uh, so th they are an indicator species of fresh water. Dragonflies have always been what? Dragonflies, yeah, dragonflies have always been dragonflies. Uh, dragonfly fossils have been found uh, almost two and a half foot wingspan in the uh, flood rock. And so here we have Genesis flood rock. Can I, prove, can I prove this is Genesis flood rock? Can't prove it. But by faith, as we read in God's word about the God sending a worldwide flood, this is what we would expect. So we would say, yes, this uh, is flood rock from the Genesis flood 4,500 years ago, and it is 100% dragonfly. There's been no change since that time. Uh, dragonflies are expert flyers. They can fly straight and fast or hover like a helicopter. Some adult dragonflies live for only a few weeks, while others live up to one year. So there's a lot of species of dragonflies, some that get big, some that get small. Um, dragonflies have almost 360 degree vision because their eyes make up 80% of their head. And so that's why it's very, very difficult to catch a, a dragonfly. Even when you use those dragonfly nets or insect nets, you start taking a swing and the dragonfly thinks you're doing it in slow motion because they react so quickly. So here you are in the middle of doing that swing, making sure that you're going to catch that dragonfly. Dragonfly is hovering there just looking at you and then it goes goes up, you go right by with the net, and then zoom, takes off. And so try as you might, dragonflies just have a lot of fun. You can never catch a dragonfly with a net. So uh, when I was in graduate school, we had to catch some for some research, and we used a shotgun. <laughs> Seriously, we used a shotgun with some very fine uh, uh, grain shot, you know, almost like talcum powder. And uh, it was enough to perforate the wings of the dragonfly and knock them out of the air without perforating the insect itself, because you want to find immature stages of parasites in the hemocele of the dragonfly. So anyway, they are expert flyers, and uh, yeah, sometimes you just have to use a shotgun. Um, but this is a dragonfly nymph. Now, for you young people, you want to see a dragonfly nymph in action, get your parents' permission and go to YouTube and type in dragonfly nymph and stand by to be amazed because they are incredible. First of all, this dragonfly nymph is very voracious. It's very, very hungry because it's undergoing that metamorphosis we were talking about earlier as it's making the transition from a nymph to an adult stage. And so it lives exclusively underwater. It has a special set of gills that it extracts oxygen from the water, and that's why we say an indicator species, clean water and all. And so this is a dragonfly larva, and here it is, a dragonfly larva it gets really hungry, and they will actually tackle a vertebrate. Now, dragonfly larva are invertebrates. Dragonflies are invertebrates, they're insects. But they are so savage that they capture like a minnow or even a, a tadpole or even smaller frogs. And they suck the juices out of them there. It's all very graphic. But um, they need that energy as they make the transformation. And so here's what it looks like. The uh, Odonata is the group that comprises the dragonflies. And it has a labrium. And this labrium is also called a mask. It actually drops down, shoots out, and has two very wicked pincers two wicked pincers that are poisonous on each end. And so they shoot that out and they grab a fish. And again, you can watch all this on YouTube. You, young people, please get your parents' permission. And then there's the prey, the uh, uh, minnow or something like, a, as I said, a tadpole and all. And here it is, an artist rendition, dragonfly larva, the labrium or the mask extended to capture the prey like a tadpole. And so here is, wow, this guy was taking a picture of a dragonfly nymph. And this dragonfly nymph was not happy. And again, they're very savage creatures. And it's being held by another guy. This photographer didn't know what he was getting into. And so he kind of put the camera down. He was looking at this very angry dragonfly nymph. And it's got that savage mask there with those two very wicked licking pinchers there. And he put the camera down. He leaned forward to this very angry dragonfly. And boom! Oh, I tell you what. It almost nailed him <laughs> on the end of his nose, but he got away just in time there. Some of you ladies came up out of your seat about this high. <laughs> yeah. 
but uh, that, that's, <laughs> that's the dragonfly nymph, and they can really do a number on you. And by the way, fishermen, seriously, fishermen have been nailed on the end of their finger. In Texas, we call this a, a, a finger. You know, finger, okay. And as they dig around in the mud to get the dragonfly larva, they get nailed on the end of their finger, and it do hurt because they're injected basically with a, an enzyme that degrades protein, and your finger is made of protein. So anyway, um, here's a question of the evening. Do we normally attribute these high-precision gears? And I understand. I've had people come up to me and say, Frank, what are you talking about? They can't turn. I understand they can't turn. I'm just showing you a picture there to show how they interlock. It takes an engineer to design something like that, right? These interlocking gears. And then, of course, you want to make them turn, then you would rearrange them. But the point is, do we normally attribute these high-precision gears from an explosion in a steel mill? And the answer is yes, you get explosions in steel mills, and it rains down these exquisitely designed <laughs> gears. And so they, they do that regularly when they need more gears. You know, fire in the hole! And yeah, but anyway, oh, but obviously, no, that doesn't happen. Uh, these are high precision gears. Nothing is left to chance when you design gears to interlock in a very specific way. And, and my son is an engineer in uh, Detroit, and he got his uh, mechanical engineering degree at uh, Baylor. But anyway, uh, a British zoologist, by the way, he's an atheist. He has some very unkind things to say about Christians and creationists. But he uh, took pictures of the legs of this tiny insect. This is called the plant hop nymph. And so this, this uh, British zoologist took pictures using an electron microscope that we talked about earlier, right? That magnifies things many hundreds of thousands of times. And he took pictures of those legs and he said, what we have is a prototype for incredibly small, high speed, high precision gears. High speed, high precision gears. What was he talking about? Well, here's the picture that he took. Wow. These are living gears that interlock perfectly, just like they were, dare I use the word, designed. <laughs> just like they were designed. And so here, you know, he used to be applauded for, for painstakingly taking the pictures of the living gears of this plant hopper nymph. But as an atheist, you know what he did? He spent several paragraphs denigrating creationist. And he said in his paper, and you can read it, it's available, uh, University of, of Bristol, Bristol, and uh, Sutton said, now I know the creationists are going to say this is design and there's nothing to do with it, there's no creator, there's no design. And he went out of his way to assure his readers that although you're looking at Genesis chapter 1, and excuse me, Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, God said what? That Paul said God's creation is clearly seen, right? And so when you get an atheist to take a picture of these gears, you are seeing God's clearly seen creation, as Paul mentions in Romans chapter 1. So uh, living things clearly look like they were designed, so how do evolutionists know they were not designed? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question to ask. And that's what we do at ICR. We believe that God designed things, and they look like they were designed. So you know what we do at ICR? We go down that road. We go down that road entitled design, because things look like they were designed. So what's to stop us from pursuing that line of research? We are the Institute for Creation Research, and so we're investigating that from what we call a design uh, perspective. Well, there's so many more examples I want to give, and I, I know we might be running out of time here, but I like ants. Ants are very fascinating. You remember the, uh, the fossil ant that we found, uh, the, should I say the, uh, the paleontologist found, and it's 100% ant. Um, you know, Proverbs 6.6 6 talks about the ants, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Well, scientists have learned that ants compute. Ants actually compute. How did a computer get into the brain smaller than a pinhead? And yet these ants are able to compute in ways that are unbelievable. And I'm not exaggerating, not at all. Not only can ants get around laying down a pheromone trail that other ants can follow, and you see the ants that are following the pheromone trail because they use their antenna. And they move their antenna just above the ground to pick up those pheromone molecules and process it. 
and then they're able to follow what their friend is uh, laying down there. But here we have what we're talking about. Ants make tunnels. Big deal. Well, the more research is being done, they're finding out, finding out this is a very big deal because these tunnels are unbelievable. I, I, when I was a little kid in Chicago, I used to have a little ant farm. I never thought twice about it, and it wasn't until decades later, well, let me read it to you. The results suggest that forces within the soil tend to wrap around the tunnel axis as ants excavate, forming what the team calls arches in the soil that have a greater diameter than the tunnel itself. Now look, this reduces the load acting on the soil particles within the arches where the ants are constructing their tunnel. As a result, the ants can easily remove these particles to extend the tunnel without causing cave-ins. The arches also make the tunnel stronger and more durable. The ant, the ant does all of that. And they're finding out more and more things about the ants that are simply incredible. Just amazing. You've heard of formic acid, right? Formic acid, I guess that's the simplest of what we call the carboxylic acids. And um, they're, they're a, a carbon-based molecule, but this is what the ants have. They have that formic acid. And the formic acid is, is pretty potent, pretty toxic. And birds spend one-third of their life preening. Have you ever seen birds preen, like ducks and, and robins and all that? They preen their feathers. Why do they spend so much time, one-third of their waking life, preening their feathers? And the answer is their lives depend on preened feathers. Their lives depend on preened feathers. And so how does the bird keep itself clean uh, uh, from these external parasites, like uh, ticks and mites that like to get into the birds and all that? And the answer is the birds undergo something called anting, A-N-T-I-N-G, anting. Well, Frank, what are you talking about? Well, if a bird knows that it's being bugged, literally, by these external parasites like uh, ticks and mites, the bird will find an anthill, spread its wings out, and then the, er the ants jump in and they start to uh, uh, go after these uh, mites and these ticks. And the ants will secrete this form formic acid. And voila, as they say in China, the, <laughs> the bird... Yeah, the birds are, are clean of the ticks and the mites. Some birds are a little bit more aggressive. They'll take some of the larger ants, pick up the ant with their beak, squeeze a little bit to squeeze out that formic acid, and then they'll rub their feathers aggressively with that squeezed ant secreting that formic acid. Again, the process is called form, uh, uh, anting, but it's very, very effective, and it keeps the, uh, the bird's feathers clean. So it's an amazing process. Well, the bombardier beetle. The bombardier beetle is an amazing creature. Uh, back in San Diego 20 years ago, I had a friend who was working in a biology lab at a Christian college, and it was in the evening, and he said, Frank, push away the cover of that glass bowl there. And I pushed away the cover where there was a lot of sticks and, and, and rocks and twigs and stuff like that, and he said, just grab one. I reached down, grabbed one. It was a bombardier beetle. I held it between my fingers, and then I got it mad, okay? He kind of squeezed it. I think I told him the check didn't clear or something. But anyway, he blasted a, a, a blast of, of uh, explosion at the boiling point of water, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, against the tip of my finger. And it do hurt, okay, because it's the boiling point of water, and there's actually a popping sound all from a two-inch long insect, a bombardier beetle. And uh, so here it is. Somebody's using their fingernail to hold down the front legs there, and he's swinging his rear end around. Twin combustion tubes. He can swing around 360 degrees, shooting out at the boiling point of water. You can see the, uh, the, the, uh, the smoke, if you will, the steam is really what it is, uh, of the bombardier beetle. Bang. It actually is a chemical weapon. Uh, a creation scientist by the name of Andy McIntosh out of e England. He is one smart scientist, Andy McIntosh, and he loves the Lord. 
He said, nobody had studied the beetle from a physics and engineering perspective as we did, and we didn't appreciate how much we would learn from it. And so here, do you see that silver thing coming down the top of the screen there? That's an uh, aluminum wire, and aluminum wire is going into that blob of yellow glue there. So they take some uh, glue, they put it on the back of the carapace of the bombardier beetle, and then they uh, put the wire into the glue and let it set, and then that's to hold the beetle still. And then you can see a pair of forceps. This is a pair of forceps, or tweezers. And so the guy is taking uh, one of the insect's legs there, bombardier beetle's legs, and tugs on it. That's a very mean thing to do. And tugs on it, makes that beetle good and mad. And so he swings his rear end around and blasts away there at the boiling point of water. So the question that we would ask as creationists is, first of all, there's two kinds of compounds that are secreted by this insect, hydrogen peroxide. What's a concentration of hydrogen peroxide that you get from Walgreens? 3% is all you can get. You can't get any stronger than that. You know why? Because it's toxic. It gets, it, it's, it's bad news. Get anything above 3%. And we've all had uh, hydrogen peroxide poured in our, our, our little boo-boo or something like that, a little cut or scrape, and it hurts, right? And then what does it do? It kind of bubbles, doesn't it? It bubbles. Those are pure oxygen bubbles because hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. There's an uh, an additional oxygen that is added to a water molecule. And so that uh, additional oxygen molecule is liberated very, very quickly under the right conditions. And so the hydrogen peroxide this beetle has is 23%, 23%. That means if you were to pour 23% hydrogen peroxide on that little cut or blemish, it would bubble and fizz your skin away, your muscle away, nerves away, and you'd have nice white shiny bone, okay? So as we say at ICR, please don't try that at home, okay? And you can't. It takes an act of Congress and a stick of dynamite to uh, get 23% hydrogen peroxide. You just, you're not able to get it there except in uh, research. And then the other compound is called hydroquinone. Hydroquinone is an organic compound. It is a benzene ring and it's very toxic very toxic. And uh, so you mix those two together, nothing happens. What you also need is the right kind of biological catalysts that we call enzymes. You've heard of enzymes, right? Those enzymes have to be the right enzymes that make that reaction go at only the time the beetle wants it to go. So if evolution is true and everything happened by time and chance and natural processes, you're not going to have a functional beetle like that at all. There's just too many things that can go wrong as this beetle would come about by dumb, lucky, blind, random chance. And it just, it's never going to happen. And so the beetle shows God's plan, purpose, and of course, special creation. Well, Psalm 19, as we draw to a close here, because I think we just have, uh, Heinz, yeah, a couple of minutes. Uh, Psalm 19, I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 19, yay, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb, okay? And shows a bee. I love bees as a zoologist. I just love them. And uh, so what young ladies do we have here? Any young ladies are under the age of 13? Can you see your hands? Under 13, we have some young ladies here. Now, do you young ladies, I'm not talking to the guys at all, young ladies, do you think you're brave? Do you think you're brave? Shake your head like this. <laughs> okay, do you girls think you're brave? Okay, I'm going to see if you're brave or not. <laughs> Is she smiling? Yeah, she's smiling. Because yeah. bees know they're beekeepers. I'm not saying beekeepers never get stung. That's ridiculous. But beekeepers, if they're really serious about their trade, they very rarely get stung, although on occasion they do. But uh, bees can sometimes be very, you know, mellow, like you see there. And there's a number of bees that are stingless bees. And so I like to tell the story. Uh, when I joined ICR, when it was still in San Diego, we went into the desert regions of San Diego and started studying some of the sedimentary rock units there in some of the dry riverbeds. Uh, and I'm not a geologist, so I was there to get some information as well. And somebody brought some of these portable ta tables and they brought watermelon because we were going to spend the whole day there. So they put out the table there and they cut the watermelon up. It was like ringing the dinner bell for the bees. And just as soon as they bust up that, uh, cut up that uh, watermelon there, here come the bees. Well, I started looking at them and realized, wait a minute, these are the stingless variety. 
So I just waded right in there between them, started eating the watermelon, bzz, all these bees buzzing around me and all that, and just enjoying the, the watermelon. I told the other people, there's about 20 of them, I said, come on over here, get some watermelon. Oh, no way. No way. I'm like, okay, more for me and the bees. And uh, so we had a good time there, and, those, and I never did get stung because they were the, uh, the stingless variety. Okay, this is the electromagnetic spectrum, and this is all that we can see, just this colored electromagnetic, spe uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, this, the visible spectrum is what I'm trying to say. But the electromagnetic spectrum is like this. It's just huge. But God has designed uh, photoreceptor cells that make up our retina to just register the visible spectrum of light there. That's all we need. We don't need to see in the infrared. We don't need to see in the ultraviolet. We just need to see the various colors of what we're seeing right now. And so God designed the bees so that they can see in the ultraviolet. And so the bees uh, look in the uh, ultraviolet range, and sure enough, they have, there are nectar guides that God has placed in the petals of the, uh, of the uh, uh, flowers. And the ultraviolet image generates three rings of color to guide the bees, and so they call them nectar guides. And so once again, just like the bombardier beetle, how do you get something like this coming about by time and chance and natural processes? These nectar guides in the ultraviolet spectrum, I think are very articulate uh, uh, evidence for creation, evidence for creation. And there's, there's also lots of other examples. Here we find a dandelion. This is what we see. This is what the bees see. The bees see the, uh, the nectar guides. We'll take them right to the center of the flower where the nectar is. Here's a trumpet vine flower. The trumpet vine flower, we see the gold, the yellow there, but the bees see something completely different that guides them to the center of the flower where the nectar is. And as Hickman, that, that zoology book I said that I used uh, when I was an uh, uh, undergraduate and all, they said the lines and the shapes of ultraviolet absorption acts as a nectar guide. And it's true. It's absolutely fascinating. This is why I love biology. It's, it's incredible. Um, okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with this this evening because we've got to get going. But um, scientists at Queen Mary University of London successfully taught bumblebees to score goals with the tiny ball. Do you realize that? Bees, the younger bees, not the older ones like me. They just, I didn't like to do any of that. But the younger bees help play ball. And they actually like, they enjoy, if an insect can enjoy anything, they enjoy playing football. Oh, Frank, Frank, uh -uh, you're not convincing me. Okay, I won't try to convince you. Once again, go to YouTube. <laughs> Type in B football for YouTube and prepare to get amazed because these uh, bees love to play with, with the ball. I mean, they, they can't wait, okay? There's no reward or anything. They don't get any kind of sucrose, which is a, a sugar reward. They just like to uh, 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 play with the ball. Here it is. This is an actual picture from the YouTube, and they like to bustle against each other as they try and make a score there. So <laughs> it is amazing. Uh, as one researcher, an entomologist, an entomologist is somebody who studies insects, he said, regarding the bees in general, he said, and, and this is a word-for-word -word quote. He said, these are high, 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 highly intelligent creatures, end quote. And he should know what he's talking about. So back when I was an undergraduate, we just thought bees were just like a little biochemical machine, and bzz, they go and get nectar, and they make honey. That's just the tip of the iceberg. They, they have navigation, which is uncanny. It's unbelievable, their navigation. How, how is it that they can fly all the way out, uh, upwards of maybe a half mile or more, gathering nectar, and then they find their way back to that little, that little bee colony hive? How do they do that? We just, we never even think about it. But they start doing research, and it's, it's unbelievable. Well, folks, that's, that's all, well, this is, was my introduction, okay? <laughs> 
and I wanted to get into the, the meat of my presentation on insects. We just don't have time. But we have some books out on the table, so you can start building up your creation library. Okay, and so this is really nothing more than to introduce you to creation science. So you can go to the back table and you can start buying some of these books and DVDs so you can uh, learn about creation science and be able to defend the biblical account of creation when it comes to a discussion of origins. You want to do it decently and be very diplomatic about it. In other words, you want to lead that person to Christ, don't you? So if you win an argument but you make them bitter, then, you know, but if you can at least show them to consider creation, then you've, you've made an impact there. We have the creation Q&A, just a little booklet here, but this little booklet answers a lot of questions that people have. For example, who were the cavemen? Look on page four, men who lived in caves, okay? <laughs> Where did Cain get his wife? Well, I'd tell you if I was able, but... Um, <laughs> Okay, and then also we have Creation Kids Activity Book for you young people here. This is a wonderful book. ICR just put this out last year, and we have been getting nonstop comments from parents saying how much they, their children love doing this. Creation Kids Activity Book, this is wonderful. Buy two or three copies and then give one to your neighbor, give one to your uh, relatives or whatever else because they, the kids really do enjoy that. This is the dinosaur pack here, dinosaurs. This is what you want to curl up and read to your kids, your grandkids, great grandkids or pretty good grandkids, but um, Thank you, thank you. But uh, the book on dinosaurs, okay? Not only the book on dinosaurs, but also the DVD. And the DVD is something that you want to uh, show if you're like a homeschool mom, if you have a Christian school class, a Sunday school class. We love dinosaurs at ICR. Did dinosaurs go on the ark? Absolutely. And if dinosaurs went on the ark, then they also came off the ark, and then they migrated. And, and since dinosaurs are animals, all animals, as far as we can tell, have the ability to migrate. And so they migrated to places like China, where they started calling the dinosaurs dragons, you bet. But we believe dinosaurs and dragons are synonymous. I can't prove it to you scientifically, but the legal historical evidence indicates that dragons and dinosaurs are one of the same thing. We love dinosaurs at ICR. We call them missionary lizards. Well, anyway, okay, so you got the dinosaur book and the dinosaur DVDs, okay? It comes as a pack, and so dinosaurs and the Bible go together like butter and, butter and bread, uh, just they're in, you know, they're, you can't separate them. It's just like politics and corruption. They just go together beautifully, okay. Um, ocean book. This is what I wrote in San Diego years and years ago, and I've updated and expanded it since then. Uh, the ocean book, you will enjoy this in your Christian school, homeschooling. Uh, kids love to read this book about oceans, and I, I love the oceans. I spent two years of my life uh, off the coast of Vietnam on an aircraft carrier, so I figure I ha I'm an authority on <laughs> studying the oceans and all. And then this is a DVD that goes with this. So you got the DVD on the oceans and the ocean book as well. It's available for you there. Barry will take your money. And then finally, last but not least, we have the free copy of Days of Praise, a wonderful devotion. Uh, we use this Days of Praise, Pastor, every morning at ICR, 9 o'clock in the morning. ICR has devotions on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We sing hymns, and then we uh, take prayer requests, and then we read from the Days of Praise. I don't know about you, but I need to hear this preaching. I need to hear these messages in the Days of Praise. It's good, solid Bible. And so that's a Days of Praise, absolutely free. Sign up in the uh, uh, sign-up sheet there. Creation Basics and Beyond, this, there are no illustrations here. These are just articles that we have written in terms of creation science. I've written several articles there. I've enjoyed putting this book together along with the other ICR creation scientists. If you're starting a creation library, this is a book that you need to have in your collection. And then finally, the fossil record. Uh, the late Dr. John Morris and I wrote this book years ago, and it's undergone an extension and an update since that time. We love fossils at ICR. Fossils, uh, what do we say at ICR? We say that floods form fossils fast. 
floods form fossils fast. And so this is the fossil record book, and it is a coffee table book. I wrote the last one-third of this book. It's, it's the appendix where I address the so-called missing links. We maintain the missing links are missing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And so when they start to bring up this idea of missing links, I began to do research and found out they're nothing of the sort. And I use quotes from secular sources, no cre creation science at all, purely secular sources. And it covers, it covers one third of the book there. So floods form fossils fast. Do you remember how um, they used to uh, ha had a turntable in radio stations? You know, I, worship, I used to work at a radio station, Gunnison, Colorado, KGUC, playing all the hits all the time. Well, anyway. <laughs> We had these turntables, and you would put the plastic platter on the turntable. What do they call those plastic platters? <laughs> records, yeah. People, and I worked at the radio station. People call me up and say, Frank, would you play the fossil record? <laughs> Thank you. I said, no, we don't play rock music. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and germs. Okay, so these are the books you want to have, and then Heinz is going to go ahead... Um, we have time for maybe two questions. <laughs> okay, if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll bring the mic around so everybody can hear the question as well as the answer. Okay, while you're thinking about a question, <laughs> They always ask this question during Q&A, and that is about starlight and time, right? And if you go and you outside and you see the stars, evolutionists tell you it took millions and millions of years for that light to reach Earth. Case closed, right? Case is wide open, okay? First of all, do we understand gravity? Shake your head like this. We do not understand gravity. Do we understand the nature of light? Shake your head like this. We don't understand. We know a lot about it, obviously. You know, uh, look at this. <laughs> but when it comes to starlight and time, you have to fully understand gravity and you have to fully understand the nature of light. And by the way, does light act like a particle or does it act like a wave? The answer is yes, it does. So that's called the particle wave conundrum of, of light, these photon energy. And so what am I saying? I'm saying that if we don't understand some of these very critical portions of this whole idea of starlight and time, we cannot simply wave our hand and say that it took millions of years for that light to reach Earth. Uh, Dr. Jason Lyle has his theory called the one-way speed of light, and that's something to consider that helps to answer the question from a young Earth universe perspective. And so um, there are a number of other creation scientists that are doing work there, but I saved the best until last when we're talking about the nature of starlight and time, and that is... Are you ready? The evolutionists have exactly the same trouble as we do in unanswered questions. And, and uh, so it's, uh, you know, th when they advocate the Big Bang, that immediately introduces the problem of starlight and time as well. So we are the Institute for Creation Research. We're still researching this. So pray with us, okay, that we might, within the next couple of decades, come up with some good, solid answers about that. Right now, just like the evolutionists, uh, yeah, this particular area kind of eludes us a little bit. But that's an exciting thing about science. Okay. Okay, questions? Raise your hand and I'll come around. No questions? If I don't see any, we, uh, we'll have them ask questions of you later. Sure. From the Sounds table. good. So let's uh, thank them for the presentation.